Fire your courage for coming back this evening. Hope that you get a blessing as we look in the very first chapter, in the very first verses of the Bible, to get us uh, some New Testament truth. And hopefully uh, you'll see something that won't be imagined, but hopefully you'll see something that can be a blessing to you to uh, remind you next time you begin reading the book of Genesis of uh, some things that took place when you and I got saved. Genesis chapter 1. Would you turn there, please? See if you can find it. Genesis chapter 1. And once you've found Genesis 1, would you stand with me, please, in reverence for the reading of the Word of God. We've had a good day today. We're very thankful for the Lord's blessings. Folks, hang in there. Fall is in the air. It's right around the corner. And uh, we've had blessed weather the last couple of days. We're very thankful. Genesis chapter 1. We're just going to read verses 1 through 5. Then we'll announce our text first and pray and get into the message this evening. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness He called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. <coughs> Our text verse will be verse 3, even though we're going to be talking about the first real day of your life. Amen. For me, it was February the 11th, 1968. I'm not trying to make anybody nervous. You do not have to know a date on the calendar. But the first real day that matters is when you got saved. Amen. Somebody, I believe this morning, was showing a, a Bible to Mrs. O'Neill. I think it was Sister Felicia. And the Bible had been given to her when she got saved. Amen. And she had inscribed in the front of it her first birthday and her second birthday. The second birthday is more important than the first one. Amen. Verse 3 is our text. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Let's bow our heads together for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, even on this Sunday night, we realize that it's possible that someone here has never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. So we pray that as we rejoice in the things that took place when you commanded the light to shine out of darkness in our hearts, I pray that if there's someone here unsaved, that today might be the day that's the first day of their real life in Jesus Christ. Bless your children. Help us to never forget what you have done for us. Help us never to get ungrateful for your wonderful and great salvation. Amen. Blessed by the Holy Spirit tonight as we see some things in the account of creation that remind us of what happened when we became a new creature in Christ Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name, depending on the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Won't you be seated, please? As I want to take this passage here. Now, we are Bible-believing, fundamental, independent Baptists, and we believe everything in the Bible. We don't necessarily understand everything in the Bible. And we don't all understand everything alike that we find in the Bible, especially when it comes to things that are non-essentials. We, uh, we will fight for and unite around the fundamentals of the faith, and we all claim to be Bible believers, okay? So we're Bible-believing, fundamental, independent Baptists. And if you don't see something that I'm pointing out tonight that, that we don't agree on, it is probably something that is not a fundamental of the faith, and yet I hope that as we look through these things in the first five verses of the book of Genesis, 
I hope that we can see some things that'll that'll make a, a blessing to you tonight as you think about this. And next time that you read the book of Genesis, uh, it'll be a blessing to you. The book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. Genesis simply means beginning. The genesis of something is the beginning of something. Your real beginning took place when you trusted Christ as your Savior. Amen. Before that, it's really not worth much thinking about. And I realize that we are all sentimental. I realize that we are all nostalgic. And I realize that we all think about the good old days. But the fact is, for the believer, the best thing that ever happened to him happened the day that he trusted Christ as his Savior. That's when the light came on in your soul. The Bible makes reference to that in the New Testament. It says that, and God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined also in our hearts. And the same God that created this world that we read about in Genesis 1, 1 through 5, created you as a new creature in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, on the day that you got saved. I, uh, when the first time I preached these thoughts and got these together, I actually preached them as a, as a chalk talk message. I had a great big four foot by eight foot chalkboard behind me and, and hung paper over it and drew a colored chalk talk message while we preached. But I just want to give you some thoughts that, that perhaps you can write down. I'm going to give you uh, some C's tonight. Uh, six C's, and below those we'll give you some other things as well. But I want to talk to you tonight about God's creation and your salvation. And I want you to see some things from God's creation that remind you of the blessing of your salvation. We're going to be looking simply at the first five verses of the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. I was told that one preacher by verse 1 where it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, that he wrote in his margin there, and I believe all the rest too. And that's the truth. We believe all of it. Amen. Amen. We believe it from generation to resolution, from Genesis to Revelation. We believe it from front to back. We believe it cover to cover. And the material that we're going to look at uh, tonight covers the first day of creation. When we end there, verse 5, the Bible says that the evening and the morning were the first day. Let me just emphasize once again that as you read these words, you ought to think about that there was a day in your life where God moved in such a special way that you were born again. And whenever that day was, for you, that was the first day. I read a man's autobiography who was a Christian, and for about 200 pages, perhaps, he told about himself before he got saved. I noticed he talked about himself in the third person, like it was a different uh, person all the way through there. And then when uh, he got saved, and started off from the time he got saved and went for another 250, 300 pages, uh, he always referred to himself as I. And that was because that he viewed the day that he got saved as his first day. That's when he really uh, came to live. Now we're going to look at some facts of the Bible found here in Genesis 1, 1 through 5 about creation. But we're also going to look at the figure, that is, a great likeness of what happened uh, on the first day of your uh, creative week, the first day that you came to know the Lord. The first seed that I want to give to you tonight as you think about uh, this uh, wonderful picture is the creation, the creation. And I'm going to talk about when God brought you uh, into this world, and not uh, the new creation, but the fact that when you came into this world, you came into this world because God brought you into this world. And the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We may think of people sometimes as accidents. Sometimes parents will even 
tell their children, you weren't planned. But the truth is, you were planned. <laughs> it's just that mom and dad may not have known about it. But God planned uh, for you. And uh, the, when we see the creation here, I want to give you a note underneath that of God's design for purity. I am of the persuasion that when God made this world, He made it perfect. I don't believe there was any darkness when God made this world. The darkness doesn't show up until verse 2. God made this earth perfect. God doesn't make things imperfect. God makes things perfect. And the fact is that the Bible says in Isaiah 45, 18, Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Isaiah 45 verse 18. And when the Lord created the heaven and the earth, the Bible says that it was a great rejoicing time for the morning stars and the sons of God. When you read about sons of God in the Old Testament, in every case, it is a reference to angelic beings. In every case. A son of God in the Bible is a direct creation of God. <coughs> By faith in Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. And so we're called sons of God. In the Old Testament, the Bible says in Job chapter 38, you remember when Job kept saying, Oh, I wish I could find him. I wish I could have an opportunity to throw my questions at him. I wish I could have an opportunity to fill my mouth with arguments. I wish that I could go to God and talk to him and find out why he's letting this happen to me. Then the Lord finally did talk to him. And when he talked to him, the Lord asked Job some questions that Job could not answer. The Lord mentioned some things to Job about which Job had no understanding whatsoever. The Lord somewhat rebuked Job by saying, you think you know so much because you know more than your critics. But one of the things he asked Job was, where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? He basically was saying, Job, you may be old, but you haven't been around here as long as I have. And he said, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars shouted together, or sang together, excuse me, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. When the Lord created the original heaven and earth, the sons of God shouted for joy. The morning stars sang together. That's Job chapter 38. Verses 4 through 7. Now that's the fact. God created the earth. He created it perfect. He created it. And there's a lot of things that people debate about and talk about and speculate about. But God made the world in such a wonderful uh, situation and for such a purpose that the sons of God were thrilled about it, shouted for joy, and sang together. Now here's the figure that I want to point out to you today. Is that God brings people into this planet. And when people come into this planet, we know that they inherit a sin nature from Adam. But the fact is, they come into this world without ever having committed a single thing. They come into this world, and as soon as they're born, they start going into the wrong direction. But they come into this world with God just bringing them into this world. And if you don't believe in miracles, I personally believe that every physical birth is a miracle of God. Uh, it, for somebody that, that doesn't believe in the Lord, it may seem that it's just such a physical thing and, and people who've been raised on farms have actually been able uh, to watch uh, little uh, cows having their babies, to see uh, horses uh, have their offspring and to see other animals of the, uh, of the farm be able to bring forth birth. But I want you to know that there's something special that goes on when a baby is born into this world. The Bible says the fruit of the womb is His reward. Children are an heritage of the Lord. And the Lord has plans for people in 
in the mother's womb. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7.29, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Unlike the beliefs of some five-point Calvinists, I don't believe that God made Adam so he would fall. I don't believe that God set up Adam as Arthur W. Pink and some others have proposed in their Calvinistic writings. I don't believe that God uh, put the uh, serpent in the garden uh, so that Adam would fall and that God could be glorified uh, by redeeming man after he had sinned. I don't believe that God wants anybody to do wrong. And I don't believe God sets you up uh, to do wrong. I believe that God made Adam and Eve innocent and pure and upright. But Adam sinned. And you may have indeed been a sinner by birth, inheriting a sin nature from Adam. But you're also, my friend, a sinner by choice. There came a time when you deliberately chose to do wrong. Now the second thing I want to point out to you in verse 2 is the chaos. There's chaos in verse 2. There's a creation in verse 1. I believe that creation of verse 1 is perfect. But something is different in verse 2. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 the Bible says, And the earth was without form and void. And uh, if you can disagree with me about this, and uh, you and I can still be friends, but I'm telling you that I believe that something happened between verse 1 and verse 2. I believe that verse 1, God created this world and it was perfect. It was ready to be inhabited. God doesn't have to fool around with something. He can make it right the first time. And I believe that He did. He made it to be inhabited. He didn't do it in vain. Sons of God shouted for joy. But when we come to verse 2, there is chaos. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, the Bible says. The earth was without form and void. Now I'm not going to go into this, but I'll tell you that the expression without form and void is only found in one other place in the Bible. And it's not referring to this creation, but it is referring to judgment. And scripture with scripture, one of the best ways for you to interpret a scripture is with another scripture. If I read to you here where it says and the earth was without form and void and I just say to you that means judgment. All you got is my opinion which is not worth anything. But when I tell you that the only other place in the Bible where this expression is used without form and void has reference to God's judgment don't take my word for it. Go home and look it up. When you see that that gives some weight to you thinking that well it just may be right disciplinarian because 
because of the era in which he was raised. Some of you folks know what I'm talking about. There was a time when even non-Christian people had some ideas about the way things were supposed to be that were biblical. There were unsaved people who believed, for instance, that the way to raise, to raise a child was to rear him from the rear. There was a time when unsaved people thought that a man was supposed to marry a woman and he was supposed to stay faithful to her till death do you part. Amen. There was a time where people believed that. There was a time where people believed you were supposed to pay the bill. Amen. There was a time where people believed you were supposed to work if you were able to. Amen. You were supposed to work and not depend on somebody else to take care of your needs. And that's the way my dad was. And so by the time I was 14, I'll be honest with you, there are some things I've got, not gotten into. I will testify to you this. That my testimony lines up with the points of this message. Because by the time I was 14, my heart, my mind, my morals, and what I could get away with was just darkness. Because of the darkness of being alienated from God, because of the spirit of darkness, the devil, the prince of darkness, <coughs> had filled me. I will say real quickly that I believe that there was a time when the devil had a throne. And the devil was not content with where his throne was. I'm going to read you a passage that talks about Lucifer's fall. Why he fell? He fell because of pride. And in his proud state, the Bible records something that the devil said that indicated that he had a throne that he wanted moved. And we're going to look at what he said to indicate where it may have been and where he wanted it moved to. The Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, Now here, the Lord quotes Satan and what he was saying in his heart. I will ascend into heaven. Well, where was he when he fell? I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Wow. Lucifer's throne was something he wanted to exalt above the stars of God. Now think with me. Come on, put on your thinking caps. If the devil's throne was something he wanted to exalt above the stars of God, where do you suppose it was at the time? Below the stars of God. He wanted to exalt. He said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I also will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. And the Lord was quoting what the devil was saying in his heart, and it reveals some things about what may have happened on the original earth. We're not going to say a whole lot more about that, but I'm just giving you some reason why I believe what I do about the fact that there was a time when the God of this world, as he's called in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, was limited the God of this world and wasn't content with it. He wanted his throne to be exalted above the stars of God. That's why there was some shouting for joy among the sons of God when the world was created. The Lord said to the devil in Ezekiel 28, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Ezekiel 28, verses 14 and 15. These are the two main passages that tell us something about the fall of Satan. Jesus said, I have, a, I have beheld Satan uh, fall as lightning from heaven. And so we do have a couple of additional references. But these are the main ones that say something about it to give us some indication of what happened. We do not have a definitive uh, statement saying when it happened. But comparing Scripture with Scripture, I'm just telling you that it looks like there was a time when this world was created, then in the next verse, there's darkness. I know that what character in the Bible 
is associated with darkness and what thing is associated with darkness. Let me just say before that we get into the next point, which is going to be more positive, that every man is in darkness today without Jesus Christ. Amen. And God calls you out of this darkness. You are blinded before you get saved. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that is lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. And I want you to, I want you to say, before you get saved, your life's not worth looking at. Your life is without form. Your life is void before you get saved. It's not until you get saved that God gives you a purpose. For living. Amen. Third thing that I want to point out to you in the second half of verse 2, if you're still here. As I think about you and me getting saved, the creation, God made us upright, but we made a mess of it. The chaos, that's an illustration of the mess. But in verse 2, the second half of the verse, I see a picture of the third C conviction. Conviction. Two men came down to Con Lane in Albany, Georgia. Because we had visited Pine Bluff Baptist Church. Pastor and one of the deacons, I think he was, Brother Johnson, came and knocked on our door and came into our house. <clears throat> we had a third visitor, and now I know who he was. Brother Lyon, back those days, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't have a clue as to what was going on. I was the most scared, bothered, agitated person I'd ever been in all of my life that one evening that they came over. And it's cause I didn't know it at the time. But I pulled up my chair and sat against the wall on this side while the deacon sat over there and the pastor sat here in front of my mom and my dad talking to them on the couch. I didn't know it, but somebody had slid up next to me. Amen. Holy Spirit. Amen. The Spirit of God Amen. moved upon the face of the wives. Amen. My life was chaos. Who knows what happened? You need to be thankful you got saved when you did. Amen. You need to be thankful you didn't get into more chaos than you did. Right. If you got saved as a child, you ought to really be thankful for that. Amen. I wish I got saved at the age of four instead of 14, but I'm so glad I got saved at the age of 14 instead of 44. Amen. Because my life was going in a wrong direction. I would have got out of that house by the time I was 18 if things went normally like that they did because I did get out of the house when I was 18 and joined the military. If I'd been lost when I joined the military, my life would have been a completely different story. Thank God. Same God that moved upon the face of the waters came down to Con Lane, came in my house and sat next to me while the preacher was looking at my mom and daddy talking to them about all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. I didn't know what was going on. All I knew was it was personal. And it was like that the Lord was just sitting right next to me. And every time the preacher was reading to my mom and dad, it's like the Lord just looking at me. Amen. I'm serious. It's like it's like he turned and looked at me. And I didn't, I, I'm, I'm imagining that because I wasn't, a, I wasn't aware of a presence now. I tell you what I was aware of. I was aware of sin Righteousness and judgment. Amen. I knew I was wicked. I knew God was holy. And I knew I was going to have to answer to Him. And I knew I was headed for hell. That's because the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the watch. Amen. Conviction is the third C. And along with that, for those of you that take notes, I'm going to call that the dove of preparation. For those of you who know your Bibles, and for those of you who write notes, the creation was God's design for purity. The chaos, I don't get, think I gave you this, is the darkness of pollution. The darkness of pollution. But the conviction reminds me of the dove of preparation. And we all know who the dove is a symbol of, right? The dove is a symbol of that blessed Holy Spirit. You remember when the Holy Spirit 
uh, came at the baptism of Jesus Christ, he descended in bodily shape yes. as of a dove. And the Bible says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. Now here's the fact. The Holy Spirit made the first move in the darkness, preparing the world, I believe, to be remade. If you don't believe that, then it would just be the continuation of the creation. But I believe that it was to be remade. And this reminds us of the dove that told Noah that the world was ready to be replanted. <coughs> I will just point out to you real quickly that the word replenish is used when God gave the commission to Adam and Eve to go populate the earth. He said, go and multiply and replenish the earth. The only other time you find the word replenish is in Genesis chapter 9 where Noah gets out of the, the ark and God says to Noah, he says, you go forth, you multiply, you be fruitful and replenish the earth, scripture with scripture, do what you want to with it. I just compare them and think about it. But here's the figure. The Holy Ghost made the first move in your conversion. In your darkness, he would prove you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then he is the one who revealed Jesus Christ to you, dying for you on the cross. Amen. The ministry of the Holy Spirit in this world is to convict, is the word we use. The Bible word is reproof. Reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And after it reproves us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, he reveals Jesus Christ to us. He glorifies the Son of God in your heart and in your mind and in your life where you learn and you understand that while you're headed for hell and there's no way out and there's nothing you can do and reformation will not do it, somebody preaches to you under the power of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit says, like the songwriter did, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin and left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Now I'd like you to look please in verse 3. You folks know that's true about the conviction work of the Holy Ghost. When the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters in this work of creation, note the order in which I've given it. The order in which I've given it is the order in which it appears. The things I've associated with are things that appear to me. But the fourth thing I want you to notice is in verse 3, and that is the command. We've seen the creation, the chaos, and the conviction. We've seen God's design for purity. We've seen the darkness of pollution. We've seen the dove of preparation. Now we see the command, and the command is a declaration of power. Where God says, let there be light. I'm so glad when the light came on in my soul. Amen. For me, I believe it happened in the pew as I responded. For you, it may have been in a, at a mourner's bench. It may have been in your backyard. It could have been... I, we had the one family of the Denards over here. I remember where I led each one of them to the Lord. Two of them, it was in their living room. One of them, it was in a camp. That camper will always be the place, the birthplace in the Lord, in my mind, of seeing Sister Sharon get saved. Could have been anywhere for you, but there was a time in your life where the light came on. Didn't have to be at church. Could be at church. Many people have gotten saved in an, what I call an inquiry room, a personal worker's room. Some people get saved in an altar. But the command was, let there be light. Now here's the fact. Before the sun was created, on day four, we didn't read this, but the sun gets created way down verse 14 through 19. The sun and the moon hadn't been created yet, but light was already there. Because God said, let there be light. There was light before the sun ever showed up. Amen. Read your Bible. Say, I can't explain it. How do you explain it? I don't have to explain it. Just read it. And you may not understand it all, but the fact is, the fact is, there was light there before the sun ever showed up. The sun didn't get created till the fourth day, down in verses 14 through 19. Here's the figure. And I quoted at this verse earlier. When you got saved, you could put it this way. For God, who commanded the light to 
to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. Amen. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, <coughs> verse 6. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Everyone that believes it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I said this is a declaration of power. You said, well, you say, well it's light, not power. Well, you see what happens if you don't pay your power bill. Your lights cut off. Good night. And somebody says, I didn't pay my life bill. And guess what? If you didn't pay your power bill, it's exactly the same thing. Amen. I know there's other things powered in your house besides the life, but they just some association with that. Don't buy it. Enjoy it. Amen. <laughs> it's a declaration of power. Then I want you to notice in verse 4 another thought about you getting saved. That is... When you got saved, there was a division that took place. Amen. Verse 4 says, And God saw the light, that it was good. Amen. And God divided the light from the darkness. Amen. The fact is, before God joined anything in this chapter, He divided. You didn't keep that in mind. Some people think that division is the worst thing in the world. You don't want to divide what God joined. <coughs> But division itself is not necessarily bad. God doesn't want His people to be divided. There's some things that you need to divide. God doesn't want a home to be divided. Amen. Man's supposed to be in unison with his wife. Amen. You mark this down. The devil is always trying to unite what God divides. God divides light from darkness. And the devil is always trying to divide what God unites. Amen, preacher. If you're married, guard your home. Because the devil doesn't want your home to stay together. Amen, preacher. Somebody said, preacher, I prayed about it and I'm still leaving. Yeah. I said, you may have prayed about it, but that's not what's right. That's right. God joins you together. Don't bust it up. Right. Let not man put asunder. But when you got saved, there was a division that took place. And God divided the light from the darkness. The same God who divided the light from the darkness, who divided the sexes, who denied, divided the nations, He divided you. Amen. This is something that you and I had no idea about what was going on when we got saved. But this book is like a surgical instrument that God used when you got saved. Yes. That when it was preached or read to you, it went beyond your ears. Amen. And this book went inside and did some cutting. Amen. The Bible calls it a spiritual circumcision. Amen. I'll give you the verse. We're almost done. The Bible says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharp." sharp than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder Amen. of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It was at that point, that's Hebrews 4.12, that you put off positionally the old man. You were circumcised in heart, circumcised, cut loose, dearly beloved. And at that time, God gave you the ability to discern between truth and error. Because you now have the Holy Spirit. And because you have the Holy Spirit, you have the ability in you. I'm not saying that you are going to be a mature Christian right away. But you have the ability in you, if you'll yield to God, to where He'll show you what's right and what's wrong. Amen, preacher. And the truth is, if you ever got a question or ask about it, it's okay. The Holy Spirit's probably already showed you you ought to quit that. That's right. Amen. You're just about not going to have to ask the preacher about something, you know, and say, is this right? And it's already right. It's just not going to happen. You're not going to come down this aisle at the invitation and say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm so troubled. I'm thinking about starting to come to church on Wednesday nights. You think it's okay? 
No, you don't have to do that. When you bring up something, it's because the Holy Spirit has already been working in you. Amen, preacher. And got you thinking, maybe I ought not to do that. Maybe I ought not to listen to that. Maybe I ought not to go to that. That's the division of perception. That's what light and darkness is all about. When the light comes on, not only does it clear things up for you, but it enables you to be able to see for the first time in your life. Amen. The conclusion is the final C, and it's the conclusion of the message. That is verse 4 and 5. God saw the light that it was good. Verse 4, just the very first part of the verse. In the conclusion, we're seeing the delight and the pleasure. God saw the light that it was good. God called the light day in verse 5, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Here's the fact. In what we've read about this first day, God begins with making light to shine out of the darkness. And he said, that light is good. You know what that makes me think? That darkness was bad. Yeah. We needed some light to help us in our darkness. And when you got saved, that was good. And really, in light of eternity, it's the best thing that ever happened to you. And it may very well be the first really, really good thing that happened to you in your life was when you got saved. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Maybe your parents are never going to afford a Christmas gift, a birthday gift, or anything all your life. When you've got saved, you've got a gift given that's an unspeakable gift. Amen. Give God the glory. He's the one who saved you. He's the one who called the light to come on out of the darkness. You got saved by grace through faith, receiving the gift of God through trusting His Son, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. If you had been left alone to just go your way, you were in chaos. You were in darkness. There's no telling how, what your end would have been. And God came by the Man thought he was doing right. He convinced himself he was doing right. That's what you do. We can, to live with ourselves, we convince ourselves that we're doing right. But he was in darkness all along. And then on the road to destruction one day, he really saw the light. Amen. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Amen. And he said that the light that he saw was above the brightness of the sun. See, that light he saw was the light that created the sun. Amen. That light he saw had been in existence before the sun ever showed up. This light is a type or picture of Jesus Christ and the light he gives to you and me. God saved him, turned him inside outward, turned him right around, and sent him preaching the faith that he once destroyed. Amen. God can do that for you. If he has, thank the Lord for it. Let's stand together. Get back to prayer.